appreciate your attention as we continue our program. Our keynote speaker today, John Taft, is CEO of RBC Wealth Management in the United States with more than 2,000 financial advisors in some 200 offices located in 42 states and $227 billion in assets under administration. Since beginning in the financial services business in 1981, John has represented his industry and his company with passion and commitment and recently finished his tenure as chairman of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. He has served our Twin Cities community on a multitude of nonprofit and public service organization boards that are frankly almost too numerous to mention but which are all listed in your program. John is the author of Stewardship, Lessons Learned from the Lost Culture of Wall Street. He graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa with a Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale University, and he earned his master's degree in public and private management from the Yale School of Organization and Management. John is here today to share some of his personal insights, observations, and stories from his book with us. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Taft. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to uh, be able to address this group. If, if and when you buy or receive a copy of and read my book, uh, you will note that the Center for Ethical Business Cultures is, uh, made a significant contributions at several points in the book. It was uh, uh, Ron James uh, was one of the people who wrote about the book and gave me a on the cover endorsement and then Al Watts who is affiliated with the organization. Al, I'm told you're in the audience. Are you here anywhere? At any rate, Al uh, gave me a book at a Center for Ethical Business Cultures event um, called Navigating Integrity and it was incredibly helpful to me in formulating my thoughts about the core principle of stewardship and in that book he uses an analogy that I was mentioning to Ron I think is very apropos and that was um, of ethical principles and of stewardship as an ethical principle really serving as the keel on a sailboat the ballast that allows the boat to maintain its direction and to stay upright in relatively in, in turbulent conditions. And I think that's a very good analogy for the importance of ethical principles, core principles, uh, uh, like stewardship in, in the business world. Now, I have to tell you that the, a book written about stewardship and ethical principles by a participant in the financial services industry does from time to time engender some skepticism. The, uh, I, I was uh, interviewed in Hilton Head right before RBC sponsors a PGA golf event, the RBC Heritage, by the Island Packet. And the reporter, the editor, the, edit, the reporter was over to meet with me and the editor said, what, what, what's this guy's book about? And uh, the reporter said, I don't know, it's about, uh, I think it's about morals on Wall Street. To which the editor replied, well, that must be a short book. And the reporter, to his credit, though, said, well, that is exactly the point of John Taft's book, is that the reaction today is that if you are talking about ethical business practices, if you are talking about stewardship, if you are talking about moral behavior from inside the financial services business, you don't have a lot to say. Um, I am, this is my first published book. And I will tell you that I've learned a few things. I've made some mistakes. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that you need to think long and hard before you decide not to dedicate your book to your family. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to tell you that my family endorses the dedication, which again, when you buy it or get a gift and read it, you will see is dedicated to individual investors dot, 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 and their faith in a better future. Because if you think about it, investing is an act of faith. For you to put your money into stocks or bonds or mutual funds or any investment security, you need to believe that the value of that investment will grow over time. That is, you need to believe that in some fundamental way the future 
is going to be better than today. So at its core, my book is about the future. It's a hopeful book. It is an optimistic book. It is a book about how we all together, inside the financial services industry, and then drawing on those lessons in the business community broadly, can work together to make the future better than today. Thus, the lessons learned from the lost culture of Wall Street, lessons learned from what we went through in the financial services industry applied broadly to the business community and to the broader culture. I wrote the book during a very dark time or started writing it. That was the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 when our clients were going through and many people in this room were going through and I was going through uh, an experience I never choose to repeat, watching the value of our retirement savings drop by as much as 50%. And when we were down 50%, if you remember back, there really wasn't any conviction that things were going to get better from there. There's a picture in the book. I wrote the, uh, the uh, forgive me, those of you who are financial advisors in the room, I wrote the book for financial advisors, one of whom came up to me and said, does your book have pictures? And I said, I, I wanted financial advisors to read it. Of course it has pictures. At <laughs> any rate, the, uh, the, there's a picture of, the, of that uh, US Airlines flight, that, that the emergency landing in the Hudson River, Captain Sullenberger. And it's that incredible photograph of the plane sitting on the waters, you know, and then all the passengers standing on the wings. And you can imagine sirens going off. I, I met somebody who was standing on those wings in that plane. And uh, you know they're dazed and confused and disoriented. Uh, they thought they were going to be in Charlotte. In fact, they're in the Hudson River, and they just went through an incredibly traumatic experience. But at that point, standing on the wings, they're pretty sure they're going to survive. They realize that what they just went through was an emergency landing of the airplane, not a crash and fatal landing of the airplane. And to me, that's a perfect analogy for what our clients, what we all went through in 2008 and 2009, and that was an emergency landing of our wealth management airplane, of the financial system. We got right up to the edge. Those of you who aren't in my business probably don't realize how close to a fatal crash of the financial system we got. We got right up to the edge, but we did survive. It was an emergency landing. I wrote the book in part because I never want anyone to have to go through that again. So the good news is, and I'd go more into this if, it, if you were our clients or if I were talking to a financial services industry group, is that a lot's already happened to make the financial system safer, sounder, more secure today than it was in 2008 and 2009. You know, Capital levels for major organizations, financial institutions are higher, and they're going to get much higher, hundreds of billions of dollars of cushion that didn't exist going into the crisis, less leveraged. Activities that were hidden in off-balance sheet vehicles have been brought onto the balance sheet. Derivatives need to be traded and cleared centrally with more disclosure and less risk. Regulators have tools they didn't have in 2008 and 2009 to, to deal with failing financial institutions who aren't banks. Think about Lehman Brothers, think about AIG Insurance Company. And then uh, we are in the middle of the single largest reworking of the rules under which the financial system operates in our lifetimes because the financial system today bears no resemblance to what it looked like back in the beginning of the 20th century when the major rules were last written. It's a global, interconnected, interdependent system, which means that any time an extreme event occurs, and they occur all the time, they're facts of life, you can't anticipate them, you can't get out of the way, and thinking you can is probably the worst mistake you can make. But when those extreme events occur, the consequences in our global interconnected world spread much more quickly and go much deeper than ever before. The contagion risk we have today is the downside to the benefits of a global financial system. So we need to put new rules into place to contain contagion risk 
and prevent systemic meltdowns, fatal crashes of the financial system from happening. And that's going on. All good news. But here's why I wrote the book. And that is that none of that, as important and necessary as it is, is enough to prevent future financial crises. We also have to address the culture of Wall Street, the culture of the financial services industry, which in my opinion is broken and which hasn't been fully repaired. Now what do I mean by that? Well, the basic mission and purpose of financial institutions, the reason we exist is to serve as intermediaries. Now, what we do, and it's very simple, is we connect up people who have money, investors, individuals and institutions, with people who can deploy capital, corporations, governments, not-for-profit organizations. And we do it in a way that efficiently allocates capital and allows the economy to grow more robustly than it could without financial institutions and without a financial system. That's our purpose, our mission. We are intermediaries and we are means to greater ends. We are not principals unless we're putting our balance sheet to work in service of our clients. We are agents and we are not ends unto ourselves. But how far from that culture did we stray going into the financial crisis? How completely did losing our way contribute to the financial crisis? And how little we've actually found our way back to that core principle even today? Now, Robert Schiller wrote a really interesting book. He's a Yale professor called Finance in the Good Society. He's very, very bullish about what finance can do to improve our lives. But listen to what he says about the financial services industry. Most people define finance narrowly, yet financing is an activity really for creating the architecture for reaching goals. The goals served by finance originate with us. They reflect our interests in careers, hope for our families, ambitions for our businesses, aspirations for our culture, and ideals for our society. Finance in and of itself does not tell us what our goals should be. Finance does not embody a goal. Finance is not about making money per se. It is a functional science in that it exists to support other goals, those of society. Well, that is the problem. We have lost our way in the financial services industry. And there's a quote in the book from a French revolutionary and poet, too many laws, too few examples, which really describes what's going on in my world today. We are trying to fix a problem, the absence of the right ethical and moral culture in the financial services industry with hundreds of laws, thousands of regulations, and millions of pages of rules when fundamentally no amount of legislation, regulation, or rulemaking will solve the problem and will make up for not getting the culture right. If we don't act like responsible stewards, we're going to repeat the mistakes and the crises that we just went through. Now there's a whole chapter in the book on what stewardship means because I felt it was important A, to come to my own definition and, and try to explain what, what it means. But I think there are, three, there are three definitions that sum it all up. Very succinctly, uh, there's an author named Peter Block who writes that stewardship is the choice for service. It's thinking about what the impact of your actions on other people. It's thinking about what you do in terms of being part of a community and in terms of having constituents that will be affected by your actions. And fundamentally, stewardship is waking up in the morning and thinking about what you do, whether it's working for a financial services firm 
or a university or a not-for-profit organization in terms of leaving the world a better place than you found it. Now the whole, all these lessons which I try to tease out of the financial crisis and the financial services industry's experience over the last five years really just represent the narrow case, in my opinion, a case study for, and a narrow case, for a general societal failing when it comes to living up to our stewardship responsibilities. Use the analogy of Charles Dickens' Christmas story. The financial crisis really was the ghost of Christmas past. We're learning about how we behave badly by looking at the financial crisis. The ghost of Christmas future in terms of stewardship failings, that's really the sovereign finances of developed nations. Europe, which is 10 years ahead of us, but the US, which last summer almost unimaginably flirted with the prospect of defaulting on his public debt. And yet I just read this morning that John Boehner is once again holding the full faith and credit of the United States of America hostage to fiscal policies. Unbelievable. Political leaders in Washington know what you all know, and political leaders in Europe know what you all know, and that is that the level of entitlement promises they've made to their constituencies cannot be supported at current levels of taxation. Nobody has the stewardship courage to stand up and fix the problem. And believe me, if that problem isn't fixed, it will make the financial crisis of 2008 and 9 look like child's play. So now we look out into the ghost of Christmas future and you've got climate change. You've got resource scarcity married up to population growth. You've got income inequality. Say what you will about Occupy Wall Street. It is a shot across our collective bow on one of the most pernicious social issues we face, which is the widening disparity between people at the top and people at the bottom, which only leads to serious social issues and retards economic growth. There's no question about that from economic studies that have been done. Now, I told you this was a hopeful book. I told you this was an optimistic book because I believed fully in my heart that we have the capacity to address all of these issues, but only if, as business leaders and as private citizens, we live up to our stewardship responsibilities and commit to leaving the world, our world, a better place than we found it. This isn't just a problem with leaders. Michael Lewis, the big short, money ball, uh, is one of the best read writers uh, of the financial services industry I've ever read. He has a, a really interesting formulation. He says, the problem isn't the greed of the few, it's the misaligned interest of the many. And he has an, an analogy, he, or, uh, he has this, uh, this image of, he says, alone in a dark room with a pile of cash, we all reached into the pile of cash and took our share. This is a societal problem and we all have to address it. The book, Stewardship, starts and ends with uh, stories about my grandfather. My grandfather was one in a long line of political Tafts. He was a son of a U.S. president, William Howard Taft. He was a Senate Majority Leader for the Republicans in the 40s and 50s, Mr. Republican, Mr. Integrity, chapter on him in John F. Kennedy's book, who you cited, Profiles in Courage, the only congressman, the only senator or member of the House of Representatives to have had a memorial built in his honor on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol, 200 yards from the U.S. Capitol. And I write about my grandfather because he really does embody for me, Robert Taft, what it's like to believe in and you live your entire life aligned with core principles. In his case, it was equal justice under law. Today, I think the core principle we should all be living up to is the core principle of stewardship. And if we do that, if we wake up in the morning and we think about what we do in terms of leaving the world a better place, we can, together and individually, 
do what you all want us to do and what you all deserve, and that is create a future that is better than today. Thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate it.